a creator, it's so awesome to have all these platforms because you can do a niche little project. Like I'm doing a stop motion superhero comedy. I feel like this festival is doing such a great job at really highlighting those filmmakers and creators that are coming up with these great ideas but haven't yet broken through this Hollywood mainstream system. There's other people in the exact same position as us. They have an independent pilot and they're out here and then they're showing it around and I'm curious to hear about you know, how they came to shoot their pilot. It's a cool little community. It has been absolutely amazing learning about how we can get our show sold, packaged, learning branding. It's been an incredible experience. You can make it, but then what? That's and right. What's great about Series Fest is there's a place, a platform, and people see it. Hello, I'm Tava Malloy Sofsky, the director of the Oklahoma Film and Music Office. We are very proud to partner with Series Fest yet again, but this year bringing you. In the spring of 2021, the Oklahoma Pitchathon Roadshow. This Pitchathon partnership was really important to us here in Oklahoma because story is the goal, and it all starts with the story. And so we want to empower more Oklahomans and more people around the world to tell their stories. And therefore, we hope you will enjoy this wonderful panel um, of pitches and hope that one day they will come to your screen wherever you are. And in the meantime, please remember Oklahoma, when you're considering filming, visiting, or just coming to, to work um, or play, we have a lot here going on in Oklahoma. We have 12 eco regions that you can find just about any location that you are looking for. We also have a really strong skilled workforce that is waiting for you. Oklahoma's talent is bar none. We are so proud of all of the businesses, the infrastructure that's growing here. It's a super, super exciting time here in Oklahoma and we welcome all of you. Welcome everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Pitchathon Roadshow in partnership with the Oklahoma Office of Film and Music and Series Fest. I'm Lauren Sloan, the initiatives producer at Series Fest. We've hosted many pitchathons at Series Fest, but this is our very first pitchathon roadshow, and our road trip is taking us to Oklahoma. Creators were asked to include a tie-in to Oklahoma with their project. For example, their project is to be set in Oklahoma, feature a prominent Oklahoman, have a creator based in Oklahoma, and so on. So you'll notice a common thread amongst the projects today. Before we get started, I'd like to give a huge thanks to Tava, Jeanette, Katie, and Meredith, and the entire team at the Oklahoma Film and Music Office for making this possible. Okay, let's dive in. Here's how this will work. Today, you'll hear five creators pitch their unproduced project in hopes of taking their projects and careers to the next level to a panel of experts for feedback. As you know, before a show makes it to screen, it all starts with a pitch in the room before it can get into development. So each creator underwent weeks of one-on-one -on -one mentorship under the tutelage of Krista Gano of Working Artist Group who will join us in just a minute, to refine the art of their pitch and increase their chances of getting their project made. Each project will have five minutes to pitch, followed by seven minutes of feedback from our expert panel. I'd like to introduce them now, so panelists, please turn on your video and join me on screen. Hello. 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 Uh, I would like to introduce everybody one by one and just talk about how wonderful you are. And we're so glad that you're here. Uh, we have Ash. You want to give away so everyone knows who you are? Yeah. <laughs> Ash is an Emmy nominated creator who recently sold a half hour comedy that's currently in development at BET. Congratulations. Um, Patrick Hackett is a producer, an Emmy nominated producer, excuse me, whose films have screened at top festivals, including Cannes and Tribeca, and recently finished production on a sci-fi thriller called Cosmic Dawn. Thank you for being here, Patrick. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, Amy Janes, hello, is an award-winning documentary um, producer and editor, and her work has includes as seen through as seen through these eyes, sorry for flubbing that, narrated, narrated by Dr. Maya, Maya Angelou. I'm gonna figure out these words during the event. It's gonna happen, it's gonna to come together. Um, and for the Sundance channel, 
And Amy also runs the Oklahoma Film and Television Academy, which is actively training a workforce for the state. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Richard Jaynes, hey, rela guys. relation, let's put that out there, <laughs> um, is an entertainment entrepreneur, film producer, and co-owner of Green Pastures Film Studio, and is also the chairman of the Oklahoma Film and Television Academy. Thank you for being here. Last but not least, uh, Rebecca Bloomhagen. Rebecca is a filmmaker and an actor that has produced over 300 shorts for digital networks such as Apartment Therapy and Refinery29. She currently works as the Director of Originals at Apartment Therapy Media. Thank you for being here. Hey, everybody. Hello. Um, so that's everybody. Thank you so much for donating your time and being here and being part of the process. Uh, pitching is truly an art form and nobody knows that better than Krista Gano. So I'm gonna say goodbye panelists. Um, and Krista, if you would please join me on screen. Hello. Hi. So Krista, um, I'm gonna hand this off in your capable hands. Um, I, thank you so much for the mentorship over the past couple of weeks with the pitchers. And uh, I'm gonna let you take it away. Wonderful, thank you. All right, well, we're just gonna jump right into it and we are going to start with Jake. Can you turn on your camera for me? Hi, Jake. So I'm going to leave and let you get started. Uh, make sure that I'm completely gone before you start to talk. Ready to go? Yeah. Hi, I'm Jake Bassnett, co-creator with Kathy Woods of Extraordinary Adventures of the Abernathy Boys an eight hour limited series about the untold true story of two young brothers who travel thousands of miles across the country all alone in search of adventure. They gain admiration from outlaws, presidents, and the nation, just not from the one person who matters most. Before Oklahoma was a state, there was a promise. People of all kinds came to the territory hoping to cut out a section they could call home, a place of their own. This land was an opportunity. It's 1907 when we meet the Abernathys, a poor but loving family living on the desolate frontier of southwestern Oklahoma territory. There's nine-year-old Bud, his little brother Tim, and their older sisters, the undaunted 14-year-old Kitty Joe, and tender-hearted but profoundly deaf 11-year-old Goldie. Bud is a dreamer who's stuck between two worlds, living up to his father's romanticized ideals of the cowboy and coming of age in a new century with new possibilities. He's imaginative and resourceful, protective, but credulous and often overthinks things, gullible. Bud is working at a federal jail at the behest of his father, U.S. Marshal Jack Abernathy, when he befriends an inmate, a Creole safecracker who takes advantage of his innocence and tricks Bud into helping him escape with a grandiose tale of outlaw gold. This embarrasses and infuriates Jack, who fires his son without a second shot. Bud will soon learn that truth and fiction are often intertwined. Six-year-old Temp, on the other hand, is optimistic and reckless, spontaneous. He acts without thinking. Like when the boys come across an ominous cave in canyon country, Temp rushes in against Bud's harsh objections, hoping to find some long lost treasure. Instead of riches, the boys find a menacing gang of bandits. They're taken hostage. But brazenly, Tim challenges the leader to a hand of five card draw, which earns them their freedom. Tim is as audacious as their father, our main antagonist. Jack is larger than life, extraordinarily strong in body and opinion, catching wolves alive with his bare hands. But he puts himself before his children, which will ultimately be his downfall. After the death of their loving mother, Jessie, with nothing holding them back and Jack's attention on himself, the young brothers set out on horseback, all alone on a great journey to New Mexico territory. Bud, desperate to prove himself a worthy man to his father and Timp, eager to earn Bud's friendship. Our characters and the country itself are at crossroads. The wild west is dying. Windmills become oil wells. Automobiles replace horses and mass media is born. The boys from Oklahoma find their way to New York City on horseback and get to ride alongside Teddy Roosevelt in his lavish homecoming parade. While in the Big Apple, Bud parlays his newfound celebrity into a chance to drive an automobile. 
The children race down Broadway without a care in the world, narrowly avoiding disaster as Temp works the pedals while Bud mans the steering wheel. But they don't stop there. They hit the road for home with the wind in their hair and 20 horsepower of American muscle at their feet. Then they're propositioned with the biggest ride of their young lives, something that has never been done before or since. New York City to San Francisco on horseback in 60 days or less. $10,000 is up for grabs if they succeed, which is pivotal to keep the family together as Jack has squandered away everything but the horses. Heartbreakingly, they arrive at the shore of the Pacific Ocean just two days late. This story is big. It's fun. It's cinematic and endearing. Gut-punching scenes of moral ambiguity are illuminated by childhood excitement and wonder. It's a family deadwood with splashes of stand by me and oh brother, where art thou? I grew up in Oklahoma. My mother is an Oklahoma history teacher and I've been fascinated by the Abernathy since I first heard about them as a bedtime story. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't do something. Opportunity is a mad fairy and courage is self-preservation. It's been over a hundred years since Bud and Temp first set out on their journey. Through them, we tell the story of a changing state. In tough times like today, people want to escape to a simpler era when it was still possible to choose your own adventure. Now, let's get back there. It's time to jump on your horse and hit the trail. Thank you. Thanks, Jake. Great job. If I can invite the panel to come join us. All right. Um, I and I'm just going to start the time so we know we have seven minutes and I'll let you guys take it from here. Who wants to go first? I'll jump in. Jake, great job. Congratulations. Uh, and what Thank a you. fun story. Um, uh, there's a lot of sort of shows that I grew up with that, that, that sort of uh, filled me with excitement hearing, hearing uh, your pitch there. Um, one question for you from me is, is why does this need to be told now? Well, it's a, it's a timeless story. Um, it's a timeless coming of age story. And, and I think it shows, it shows a, a different world and how we got to the state of Oklahoma and what it is today. It, it's, it's set in the period of transition from the territory to the state. And there's so much that happens in those few years um, that really creates the state that we have today. Um, so that's, that's why I think it needs to be told. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I'll jump in. So, uh, Jake, first of all, is this a, it, this is for a TV series? A, a limited series. Yeah. A limited series. Okay. And what's the, the, the genre? Um, adventure. Uh, it's a period adventure piece. But would you say it's dramatic, com comedic? Uh, uh, there, there are moments of drama. There are moments of comedy. Okay, um, it's a family. So kind of adventure. like an is it kind of like an Indiana Jones limited series kind of feel? Or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, limited uh, Indiana Jones limited series, um, but more akin to I would say the the tone is more um, Oh Brother Where Art Thou? Okay, um, yeah. and the style is more Deadwood. Um, so I would say even using those comps to just paint the picture of what kind of the tone and feel uh, your story is up front would be helpful to give me okay. context of okay. how I'm seeing these characters, you know, and the, you know, the, the tone of, of where we're going um, with it. Um, also so put that before uh, up front in the pitch. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So even before you start the pitch, I'm, you know, a person, um, and I think a me is uh, nodding along in terms of um, just having context so that people kind of know how to view your story, right? So okay. people kind yeah. of go into a comedy world, uh, you know, headspace, thinking about it differently as opposed to a dramatic, as opposed to an adventure, and even using um, you know, some comps, even though I'm kind of like 
want, not trying to encourage you to do the cliche thing of like, it's entourage meets such and such, you know, that mm. kind of thing. But just a, le- a, a little taste to give people some context of what they're, um, you know, expecting in your story, the feeling, the vibe, the tone. Yeah, okay, definitely. That makes a lot of sense. Absolutely, but great job. Thank you. I, I, but with that being said, I, I felt the adventurous tone in the intonation of your delivery. Uh, so to just kind of really crystallize it, I would just, you know, tell them what the tone is. Okay. So great job. Sure. Thank you. I would piggyback just a tiny bit on that as well, because that's exactly what I was looking for. As I'm listening to you as a producer, I'm really trying to understand in my head immediately what is the budget. Mm -hmm. What is the tone? um, How, what does the style look like? So just being able to present a little bit of that clarity up front with something that I may already be familiar with um, helps us like settle back and stop thinking. Cause my, I am, I am my wheels. And I would imagine other people who are, are, are looking to finance these are, are just constantly thinking like, can I do this? How would I do this? Mm -hmm. And that eases me to allow to get back into the story with you. I think okay. it was brilliantly pitched. I think I also was in on that ride with the kids. I was really excited when you started mm-hmm. to speak specifically to what the children's adventures were, were gonna be. I mm-hmm. wanted to know immediately that I could bring my 12 and 14 year old to this. Yeah. And we can relate, or I related very well to this in that we moved from Los Angeles to Oklahoma for the same opportunity. And yeah. so your answer to um, Richard's question was brilliant. This is still a place that that opportunity exists, you know, and and not many people know about Oklahoma outside of Oklahoma. And so this is an awesome opportunity to be able to share really the the culture, the the, the heart of the people. And I think your your pitch captured that brilliantly. Thank Um, you. I I also just- Hey guys, just want to let you know, we have two more minutes. We have two more minutes in this feedback round. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Similarly, I, in, in terms of um, your introduction piece of who you are and having grown up there and the story of your mom, I would have loved to have heard that earlier just because it gives okay. you a lot of street cred. Like, okay. I'm more interested in your story knowing that you're from there. I'm from Iowa and I, I just, the Midwest states get really misrepresented in <laughs> film yeah. and TV. And so I think it, it's exciting to hear like someone from there wanting to tell a story that is exciting to them. And then my other thought was like what, just mentioning like teasing what you want your audience to like go away feeling and what, who your audience might be, I feel like is exciting as a producer to hear because then you start to think, oh, I can connect this story with like the audience that needs to hear it. And it feels like a partnership that's exciting to make happen. So. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And then real quickly, I'll just say uh, great job. I'm, I myself am a, a huge fan of the Western genre. Um, so anything that harkens back or just uses this cinematic language, these, these colors, these adventure tropes, um, I mean, I, I'll watch, you've hooked me. Yeah. Um, I mimic the, uh, and, and repeat a lot of what, what has been said. Um, the quicker you stop me from thinking about questions and allow me to just ride the story with you, the, the more you'll have me. Um, so the more that I'm constantly like trying to check boxes, okay, this sounds big. Well, what's, how big's the scope? Okay, how big, uh, oh man, like how many years are we talking? New York City, model, you know, model T's. Okay, so like now you've yeah. got my, my, my budget brain going berserk. So get yeah. me out of there, get me on the road with you and um and then help me enjoy the ride great thank Thank you you. all so much thanks to the panel jake thank you great job and i'd like to welcome drew to turn your camera on all right drew hi hi i'll turn off and you can take it from there how do we define life we love we laugh cry grieve And at some point, whether it's in 20 years or 50 years, we die. Death is the culmination of life. But what if someone discovered the key to immortality? What if forever really did mean forever? 
what could you do with eternity? What would you do with your life? My one hour drama, Beautiful Surfaces, explores these very questions. In a world where aging has been eradicated, the heir to the immortality industry discovers problems with the anti-aging drugs and finds herself caught in a conspiracy that threatens not only those she loves, but also the very fabric of this new everlasting society. Hi, my name is Drew Robinson, and I'm excited to tell you about my project. I'm a public school educator here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the original idea for Beautiful Surfaces came about after a conversation I had with my father on our generational differences. We have such radically different notions on what's important. The values and norms he grew up with and, and consider sacred simply don't fit the reality I'm living in. Beautiful Surfaces serves as a neutral metaphor to explore the struggle between millennials, baby boomers, Gen Z, and everybody in between. We've all had clashes between what was and what could be and can identify with the characters in Beautiful Surfaces. Mia Goodwin, a cynical doctor with a wild streak and the reluctant heir to the immortality industry and her husband, Alejandro Hopkins, a fun-loving playboy and the adopted son of the top government leader seem to have it all. Good looks, massive wealth, and eternal youth. But beneath the surface of this hedonistic, ageless utopia, dark secrets fester. A perk of the anti-aging drugs is a perpetual early 20s physical appearance. So Mia is puzzled when her patient suddenly reverts to her actual age, wrinkles and all. Still, as a scientist, all she sees is a challenge worth solving. But her father, Marshall Goodwin, the famed CEO of Life Care Labs and the inventor of the anti-aging treatment, seems strangely uninterested in the issue. As it becomes clear that this isn't an isolated case, Mia begins questioning everything and everyone around her. And when people close to the case begin to disappear, Mia must decide what's more important, keeping her family happy or uncovering the truth. Meanwhile, Disillusioned with his role as the government spokesperson, Alejandro whiles away his days with drugs and women, much to the disgust of his mother, Tegan Hopkins, the leader of the government. When Alejandro goes off script in a dangerous part of town, he rediscovers human connection with a family of non-citizens living in the shadows of society. But after a violent attack leaves him in the hospital, there are devastating consequences for his new friends and Alejandro is forced to confront the ugly truth of the world he has helped to build. Set in a futuristic Tulsa, the show will feature a variety of landmarks and build on the rich diversity of the Oklahoma people. And although the show will include innovative designs for architecture, fashion, and technology, the focus will always be on the story and the characters. Because at its core, Beautiful Surfaces is a story about family. It's a story about children stepping out of the shadows of their parents and discovering the illusory nature of the pedestals we create. It's a story about the trappings of tradition and how it can hold us back from truly loving one another. And it's a story about the fantasy that wealth and privilege can weave about the harsh nature of the world we live in. Week to week, me and Alejandro will have to learn to trust each other as they confront the corrupted politics of the seemingly perfect society, grapple with complicated family dynamics, and navigate a tumultuous resistance movement. And despite the calculated origins of their 30-year marriage, Mia and Alejandro gradually discover how much they have in common and what they're willing to do to protect one another. Throughout the season, Mia must race to discover the cause of the aging problem and stay ahead of her father's wrath, while Alejandro attempts to make policy changes which increasingly lead him into conflict with his mother. As the world they've been brought up in begins to crack, both Mia and Alejandro find themselves asking, is this everlasting society even worth saving? Thank you. Great, thank you. Who wants to go first? I'll just jump in. I thought it was fantastic. Um, I thought you did a really, really great job setting up the world. I saw it, um, it felt big. Um, 
you asked a big question that, you know, is kind of a humanity question that we all want to know um, that immediately got the mind going. Um, this is really nitpicky where I was, I got that the inciting incident was that, or at least that's what it felt that the kind of these people returning to their original age, which is like an ironic, funny, you know, ironic thing. Uh, that's what felt like the inciting incident. Is that right? Okay, that cool. Correct. Yes, ma'am. Um, the only kind of nitpicky thing is that I would love to know more how it, how that inciting incident personally affected the dynamic between Mia and Alejandra. Um, and I get that they've been together for 30 years, but because we love to see characters struggle and their worlds completely fall apart, I just, you know, and they've been together for 30 years, I just, you know, maybe it's the gossipy part in me. I'm not even a gossipy person, but just wanted to know like what that dynamic between them, how it affected their relationship. Does that um, make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And, and the, the great thing is that when we start with their relationship, they actually don't like each other. It was a political marriage. They, they're not oh. even in love. And by the end of the first season, through this finding purpose in their own lives, they discover love in this relationship that's existed. That's, that's what I was looking for. And the reason why I say nitpicky is in terms of this pitch, because I know you only have a certain amount of time to kind of get it all in, but I would say that that part is a very crucial part in your pitch. Um, but I, I felt all the stuff there. So really great job. Thank you. Uh, reiterate what a great job you did. Congratulations. Uh, I may have missed it. Um, uh, how many episodes do you see this being? So this is, um, I, I have mapped out about three seasons so far. Um, now I imagine there's probably only somewhere between eight and 10 episodes per season. So um, it's, it's definitely on the shorter end of, of, of episodes in a season. But um, the first season is really about the kind of the aging problem, but, but it's almost like our foray into understanding just how dystopian this utopia actually is, so. Mm. Awesome. I think it's a fascinating subject to play with because uh, I think we're all, we're all looking at, um, you know, the, the elongating of, of the age of society. Uh, I think that's very timely. If you had a magic wand, where would be the distribution platform for this? To me, this feels more like a Netflix or a Hulu, just because it is sci-fi and it is kind of a, 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 what I'm calling a grounded sci-fi. So I think there's, the audience would be more of a streaming platform um, just, just by the nature of, of the content. Great, thank you, well done. Thank you. Well done, Drew. Uh, just have a question, uh, and, and Richard kind of touched on this. I I did. I also missed just the the scope of of how many seasons and and episodes uh, you were looking at for this, um, and then also just uh, I from the get go, I got that this was futuristic, um, and and then it has some sort of sci fi bent to it. I um, but that even within that genre, that's such a such a big thing. You know, is is it uh, Blade Runner? Is it scanners? You know, like where in the is it Handmaid's Tale? Like where where in this kind of dystopian subgenre are are we? Do we fit um, to and just kind of wrap around that context a little bit so we kind of know um, where where in this world we are because we've you and we rightfully so focused more on the the character dynamics, the relationships, um, the story matters more than more than the world. I would say. But um, to give it a little bit more of a wrapping, I would uh, just kind of give me a little bit more about that, that world. I think you had a great line about uh, futuristic Tulsa that came maybe halfway through your, your pitch. I would just bump that up a little bit. Okay. Uh, okay. Just, just to kind of give me a little bit more um, tone of, of where we are. Okay, absolutely. Thank you so much. You did a great job. It's um, like my imagination was sparked and it's, as everyone has said, it's so wonderful to kind of live in a sci-fi world but that is, is really grounded in questions that we all have and think about a lot now. Um, 
I guess my only thought is why Tulsa? Like what about Tulsa really makes the story more interesting and makes us, makes you want to tell it here? And that kind of goes to to the tone and the setting. Um, there's a there's a, a sub subplot about the environmental crisis that has led to the flooding of the coasts and the relocation of the capital to the Midwest. Um, and so Tulsa is actually considered the capital of the new revived uh, United States. Um, and and so there's a there's an actual um, entire storyline in both season one and season two around kind of the refugees from the coast coming to the flyover states um, and, and kind of that dynamic, which I think is fun. That would be great to hear more about and also kind of places it like in the why now world, like, yeah. I'll just also say just if we have we have one more minute I want to make sure Amy talks but like the subplots in this story I mean there's no way we could put it in five minutes it she has got this world down pat it's really really amazing well I love that and I think um I think you did an excellent job pitching it as well I think we were all really wrapped into the story and wanting to learn more and to you know just a little bit reiterate what what was already brought up because I think the panelists really have have um shot have helped illuminate some of the places that we can build it a tiny bit, but is that like, oh boy, if you start with Tulsa being the new capital, bam. I mean, that just like, I mean, for anybody, that's like, that makes you start to think like, yeah, there may be a time where we have to pull everything into the middle of the country. And now all of a sudden the middle of the country is extremely important in, you know, in the future. And I, I would have loved to have heard that a little bit more too, because Rebecca, great question, why why Tulsa? And that is an obvious reason why Tulsa. And there is just to throw something in, I'll share this map with you. There's a, a new map that came out that shows all of the, in um, 40 years from now, where will be the best climate to live? And it is right where we are with all the climate change. It also says that right here, and, and I, I think that's in really why now, why Tulsa, that if you know that fact that is something to throw in there as well it's a it's based in truth like there you know this right. idea came from a real deep understanding of the future great, great so job much. thank you all thank you panelists all right great job drew all right i'd like to welcome paige and bobby okay guys all right we will let you go with uh your pitch of weathermen Hi, I'm Paige Lepak. And I'm her husband, Bobby. The people of Oklahoma and their weathermen, and no, I didn't misspeak, this is a boys club, are in an addictive, codependent relationship. We depend on them for our lives, seriously, and for our entertainment. And they're hooked on us for their livelihoods and their egos. Our show is Weathermen, a half hour single cam scripted comedy about Oklahoma City's strange relationship with its weather and its meteorologists. And we tell that story primarily through three of our main characters each representing a perspective through which the viewer can experience that story. Our main protagonist is Vanessa Ramos. She's thrust into the weather ecosystem of Oklahoma City, leaving behind a successful career in New York as the producer of the nation's favorite morning show to follow her fiance when he inherits his father's oil business. As a result, she ends up as the weather producer for the two accurate storm team at KTOO, a job she's pretty sure is beneath her. She gets exposed to a lot of foreign concepts and her role in the show is to continuously ask, we're gonna do what and why? She suddenly dropped into a world where weathermen sell out stadiums like they're Bruno Mars and weather events like Tiger NATO will happen and no one is phased but her. Okay, so you can't just drop Tiger NATO on them and leave it at that. <laughs> Tiger NATO is what happens when a tornado hits one of our many unlicensed tiger zoos that we have here in Oklahoma which then creates a wild night where the weathermen are forced to chase both animals that are wild and weather that is wild through the streets of Oklahoma City. Fair enough. So Vanessa won't be alone in figuring out why seemingly crazy people like us have chosen to make this place their home. Tell them about Ben and Danny. Okay, so Ben Kelly grew up glorifying the Oklahoma City weather gods. It was his lifelong dream to become the chief meteorologist at KTOO. And he was a promising young meteorologist on his way to the top, which for him was to be a weatherman in Oklahoma City, uh, when a disastrous bout of stage fright during a live weather broadcast made him a viral video sensation, and not in a good way. 
He was banished off camera, but he still holds on to the hope that someday he's going to make it into a deck of meteorologist trading cards. Yeah, that's a real thing here. He had them. True. Ben's lifelong best friend and current roommate is Danny Horsechief Wynn. Danny is 50% Cheyenne Arapaho, 50% Vietnamese, and 100% good old boy Oki. He's a high school football coach and a world-class shit giver who personifies the rich and diverse culture of Oklahoma. Ben and Danny will be Vanessa's guides through this land of Oz, except in this version, instead of flying monkeys, we have windblown tigers. And instead of the great and powerful Oz, we have egomaniacal chief on-air meteorologists vying for the number one spot in the wake of the retirement of KTOO's legendary weatherman. I guess it is pretty similar, actually. Dorothy had a tornado, too. A Kansas tornado. Okay, so in the pilot, Vanessa gets to know Ben and Danny in Oklahoma City against the backdrop of an impending tornado outbreak. All while a new chief meteorologist, Clark Winnebago, an egotistical yet insecure head case, is attempting to replace the retired legend. Ben and Vanessa go out chasing tornadoes with the station's field meteorologist, Violet White. Violet accidentally drugs herself when she mistakes Ben's anti-anxiety medication for Adderall and can't go on the air. Meanwhile, the station's power goes down and then their generator fails. Vanessa has to help Ben overcome his viral trauma to save hundreds of lives from a tornado that spins up while everyone else is out of commission. As the first season unfolds, with the help of Ben and Danny, Vanessa is growing fonder of the city and further from her fiance, as they introduce her to such charming Oklahoma experiences as catching a 100 pound catfish with her bare hands and chasing that down with a fine meal of fried bull testicles. Ben is suddenly back in the running to be on air and as Ben continues to ascend, Clark starts to melt down. Ben and Vanessa's friendship grows, putting a strain on her relationship and starting up a will they won't they vibe, and we think they will. We believe this show has near infinite potential for future episodes, given the environment that we've placed these interesting characters in. Oh, in case any of you aren't from here, but you're thinking, eh, I've watched the weather, how interesting could this be? You have not watched the weather. The weather where you live is Little League. This is the big leagues. Our meteorologists co opt live network television during primetime hours for like a quarter of the year for hours at a time. We've missed the finale of several of our favorite shows because of this. And that's why we're making this show, because we're going to see a finale, even if it means we have to write the show ourselves. And we'd like to invite you to experience that moment with us. Thank you. Thanks. Great job, you guys. Thanks so much. Hannah, we'd like to welcome you back. All right. I'll go first. This is say, Amy awesome. looks excited. <laughs> this is so much fun. You have no idea how much I love the weatherman in Oklahoma. We have just yes. moved here two and a half years ago and I am like addicted. It is my, they are, you can ask my husband. I just like, I love it. I love the weather because of the weatherman. This is solid pitch, really nicely done. Um, funny. I loved how you were able to banter off each other. I always love pitches with two. For some reason, they always, um, I don't know. I, I, I encourage that often. I love it. Um, my one question, is it family friendly? Sort of. <laughs> I, like, I wouldn't say like, I wouldn't let a 10 year old watch it, but I wouldn't mind a 13 year old watching it. So where are we in the tone then of, of give me an example of another show is it like a chuck or is it like a new girl because those i would say like a parks and rec but more in the style of new girl copy okay great job you guys so much fun i look forward to seeing this i cannot tell you how much i cannot tell you how much i look forward to seeing this great <laughs> job. thank you he really does love the weatherman it's bizarre but i, I and so, so look I, I thought you guys did a phenomenal job and, and to to bounce off amy there um the energy that you both had together was 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 really special. That was great. Um, question for me is, uh, as I hear this, and I'm trying to sort of put together the comps, you mentioned Parks and Recs, which is great. I thought of 30 Rock as you're sort of talking about it a little bit. What is the percentage that you see that studio-based versus locations when you look at breaking down your scenes? I think mostly locations. A very, uh, There will have to be some studio-based stuff because it's where they work and it's kind of the home base. But as you know from you can see on the sign behind you, Twister, a lot of what happens with the weather here happens out and about. They're out in the, in the uh, community, they're going to different events. That's one of the things that we think is really um, special about Oklahoma is there's all sorts of stuff 
that the weather been kind of interjected into, right? They, <laughs> you can't plan an outdoor event such as the Okie Noodling Festival or a high school football game or a powwow without the weathermen being present in some way. And so it gives us a lot of places, a lot of locations that we can work with that will add lots of opportunities for kind of cameos or guest stars, people coming in that are recurring characters that can add a little more flavor to the show. And inject some local flavor too, and kind of put on display what Oklahoma has to offer basically. So one of the things from a producer's sort of standpoint of, okay, how do we sell this in? I look at budget, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we're dealing something with, with massive weather and you're going out onto locations. Um, uh, how much does the weather, as weird as this sounds with a show called Weathermen, how much does the weather factor into this that is gonna have an uh, impact in terms of budget over a half hour show? I think a lot of what we were thinking about is not necessarily like a special effects heavy mm -hmm. show, because a lot of what we find really interesting and funny about the Weathermen isn't like they're standing up by the side of the road and a tornado's blowing in the background necessarily but a lot of the things that are either happening on camera when they're preparing for, for a storm chase or while they're driving in a car and they're stopping at little towns along the way or they're interviewing people after a storm has blown through. And so I, I didn't really envision, and I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, like lightning striking and tornadoes blowing through. Cause a lot of the interesting stuff, including when we had Tiger NATO, which is a thing, um, <laughs> you know, that all happened after the storm has gone through. So now you're looking at damage, but not necessarily looking at special effects in an extreme sense. Yeah, same. I was thinking not a lot of special effects and any that we needed from, say, um, you know, a, a video, like we, you could always repurpose things that had already been shot previously, because I'm sure somebody has a deep, deep bank of storm footage <laughs> that could be used. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Hey, we have three more minutes in this round. Yeah, I was just going to say, I thought you all did a wonderful job. I'm a big comedy head, so uh, the concept really worked and tied into the location, and it, it immediately made sense to me. Um, I also, I thought not in addition to you all doing such a great job at your pitch, I think Richard asked a great question and a question that you, you know, be prepared to answer and that you all also answered that question really, really well, because even though your show is, is called The Weatherman, it's not just about the weather, but in terms of how it impacts um, and, and, you know, just to continue to emphasize uh, the kind of character developments and, and, you know, impact that the characters experience from that. So really awesome job. Thank you. Thanks. Go ahead, Rebecca. <laughs> I thought, yes, just echoing what everyone said, I felt like you guys had a very, um, casual delivery it didn't felt like feel like you were reading and I felt like that really added to kind of your street cred and just your pride in where you're from and um your knowledge of the world that you're speaking about I feel like a good subculture is always very universal and this is like one I didn't know about and love to would love to feel a part of um my only question really is I felt like I got a really great sense of the world and the tone, but in terms of like the individual characters, like who you would want me to feel attached to as an audience, I'd be curious, like who, who would you say is the strongest character for your, that you would want us to sort of fall in love with or? You want to say about Vanessa? Yeah, I would say Vanessa. Um, she's kind of our fish out of water and serves as, um, uh, I don't know, a conduit through which we can explain this crazy world to outsiders, because that's who she is. Um, she's kind of based on me and my experience. I moved here from Dallas 12 years ago or so. Um, and so we would really want people to fall in love with her and her journey. But then Ben and Danny also, I, I would say Ben secondarily, and then Danny would be kind of tertiary, although it's somewhat of an ensemble Cast. Well, and, and Danny gives kind of the, the perspective of the outside the weather world, but inside Oklahoma mm -hmm. City, the view, the people that are impacted by it. And that's why, you know, we kind of built his background to have a lot of that flavor that people don't, maybe don't realize is here. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, but I think Vanessa is definitely our protagonist. Patrick, uh, we only have a few seconds, so. 
That, that's great. And I would just, I was just going to kind of piggyback on that a little bit. And uh, I, I speak to our local weatherman through the television as if he's family. Um, so I understand that. Um, but I would lean on t telling the outsider story to, to help gather in the people who maybe won't be as drawn to lo your local culture and the, and the absurdity and weirdness and, and need that introduction to get into it of like, why should I care? You know, if I live in Seattle, Washington, this is something that's so, so completely foreign to me. Like, where's my entry point? How do I get into this? Why should I care? So uh, using uh, Vanessa as your conduit into that world and explaining it through a foreigner's or an outsider's eyes is, uh, is helpful. Great. Of like why we should care. Thank, Thank you. you, Patrick. Thank you guys so much. I can't wait to see Tiger NATO. I'm all over it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, okay, Jeremy. There you are. Hi, Jeremy. Hi. All right. I am going to let you go and pitch White Killer. Hey, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Jeremy Charles. I'm a writer, director, producer, and citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Um, my mission as a filmmaker is to tell stories through the eyes of Native American or Indigenous peoples, which was uh, what I've been doing for nearly a decade. Now there's a saying made famous by a real asshole from the Indian boarding school era, kill the Indian and save the man. Well, the idea for this series came from the question, what if you turned the white savior trope on its head? What if a native community actually changed the life of an outsider? My series is a supernatural crime thriller called White Killer. Hell of a title, right? It's actually a Cherokee surname. You can probably guess where it came from, but the title itself speaks directly to a central theme of the series. What if the saying was instead, kill the man and save the Indian? White Killer is set in Oklahoma on the Cherokee Reservation and has a largely native cast. It's a setting rarely, if ever, seen on the screen. It's about a community fighting back against the outside forces, threatening their way of life. And we'll explore themes of family, identity, and the temptations of power and greed. But at its core, this is a story we all know. It's the battle between good and evil. And it's about how the temptations of power can corrupt the vulnerable. The hero of the story is River White Killer, a mixed race queer teen who is traumatized by the suspicious death of his father. Orphaned, River is taken in by his estranged Cherokee family into a world that is both unfamiliar and unwelcoming. River must come to grips with his own innate abilities for magic or more accurately, uh, medicine in order to protect himself from the dark forces that are cursing his life and using him as a pawn. The evil forces at work are embodied by River's aunt Eliza, a respected community leader and environmental activist. While she's the surrogate parent that River desperately needs, she's also using him as a foil in a string of murders of white farm workers. Eliza is a skeely, a practitioner of corrupt medicine. She's a witch. And she aims to break, uh, break down the boy and groom him as her, uh, her protege but not so fast. Although deeply troubled, River really is a good kid at heart. He finds a mentor and a lovable rascal, Roy, a medicine man who teaches River to harness his abilities for good. But as you can imagine, Eliza is not pleased and supernatural warfare ensues with River caught in a crossfire. Roy is no match for the powerful conjurer and only River can come to his rescue, but will he? A tribal policeman is torn between his loyalties to the law of man and the law of blood. He uses his jurisdiction to shield River from the state authorities, especially a relentless homicide detective who is bent on putting River behind bars. To complicate matters, River has to navigate life in a new high school where he is tormented by a fresh cast of boys. There he meets his only steadfast friend, a fellow misfit named Kyla. River is beset by conflict on all sides as he locks horns with Eliza's thuggish son, and he uncovers the plot of a dubious politician who is secretly brokering land deals with Eliza's enemies. Audiences will at first feel sympathy for River as a victim, but his enemies underestimate him. River is no pushover. Along the way, he will transform from a shell-shocked introvert 
into a conflicted and dangerous figure as he comes to grips with his abilities. The more River gains footing, the higher the stakes are raised. We'll end up rooting for him against all odds in a life and death struggle for his very soul and we'll overlook his many transgressions. Have you guys seen Hunters on Netflix? Well, you could compare River's art to that of Jonah, the conflicted protagonist in that series. And if you combine the magical realism of CBC's Trickster with the tone of HBO's The Outsider, you can imagine a white killer. It's got all the ingredients of a great crime thriller, murder, rape, arson, blackmail, and more with clashing authorities and legal drama. And add to that a magical element with suspenseful depictions of the unholy, curses, shapeshifters, witches, floating balls of fire, and beings drawn from Cherokee lore. Add this all up and you've got a recipe for a hit show. Kill the man, save the Indian. White kill it. Thanks. Thank you, Jeremy. Love the story. Uh, if we can, I'm gonna invite our panel back. All right, everyone. Who wants to get started? Patrick, Casey, do you want to go first this time? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> um, well done. Uh, I have one quick question. Just what, what what time frame? Where in the yeah. where in time are we? Current times. Yeah. Current yeah. time. Okay. Great. And then uh, so fascinating. Uh, you know, I instead kind of thought of like uh, Man in High Castle, where you just kind of take something that the the zeitgeist kind of understands and knows, and just kind of flip it on a different paradigm to to see it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm kind of I'm fascinated with just kind of different perspectives like that. Uh, very early on, you you brought in the supernatural element and then described it as a supernatural thriller, or I forget exactly what the other adjective was. But it wasn't again until the very, very end that you started giving me floating orbs, and balls of fire and whatnot. And like, so the whole time I'm like, where's the supernatural? Where's this, like, where's the supernatural? Where's the supernatural? Bring me in with the supernatural. Um, when you tell me about how he's struggling in school and whatnot, and how is he, how is supernatural fit and weave into this story and not just random tropes to throw in there to make it supernatural so like let me know how that's woven into the story I, you know it's set up well with a witch and and war and there's there's so many ways to do it so just weave it for me mm -hmm. thank you yeah i can uh would like to actually piggyback a little bit on that for me um uh, jeremy i I, the the tone of your voice, like you have a wonderful kind of like bring you in to to know more and you know where are you going with this story, and but in addition to weaving in the supernatural, you started with the cultural base and mm -hmm. then it switched to something else and then it switched to something else for me and so I would be more curious to see kind of how all of those things you know, weave in. And, you know, as a, a, a woman of color who is always, you know, highlighting the importance of different kinds of stories. Um, but I would say if, if that is part of your story to connect it in the story, if it's not, then just leave it out. Uh, because the story is very strong on its own. So that's my feedback. And I think you did a great job. Thank you. Yeah, there's a uh so much more to talk about. Um, I think the challenge is uh, to distill it down. And thank you for the feedback on that. Um, if I get the opportunity to tell you more, uh, it'll take me a little bit longer. But there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, personal connection to the story. Um, and also, um, it's a very tricky situation to talk about, you know, um, Native American lore and ceremony and things like that. So I think it's really understated. A lot of the Supernatural is very understated. That's why I kind of referenced Outsider because it's mainly suspenseful. Um, but thank you. Yeah, absolutely, and I get it. Thank you. I loved it. I felt, um, I loved flipping the script. I loved the world. I, I felt like you really did a good job of introducing yourself and bringing me into the world. I think my main 
like curiosity was like tone and shooting style. I'm just curious sort of how mm. you want to tell these stories. And um, I don't know if you have developed that at all. Yeah, um, I think um, in my mind, it's really more of a crime thriller structure. Um, and then it has these other ingredients that go into it. So, you know, it's, I would definitely, you know, um, true detective or uh, like, for example, The Outsider, it's really a mystery that is constantly on the hunt to solve. Every episode has sort of a, an unfolding um, mystery that's something that can be wrapped up in an episode, but also continues throughout multiple episodes. I'll jump in. I think you did an excellent job pitching this. I love um, the world. Uh, I agree with Patrick a bit. I would have liked to have bring a little bit more of the supernatural aspect to the front. Just it kind of, um, it kind of, again, we had, it, it allows the producer who is listening to you, who's running a million things through her head to, to kind of understand better. So we were encouraging some folks to actually bring some of the comparisons up to the front so that my head can stop thinking about that and then I can run with your story. If you've given me a visual of the, of outsider or whichever, that allows me to, to remove that thought from my head and run into the story. But I adore this story. I recognize why it needs to be told now. I think there's real legs for, for this series on, on television. Um, you have multiple audiences, but to that, in my mind, I see the audience, but I'd love to hear, who do you see the audience for this? Yeah, I do think that um, the doorway is the, the crime. Uh, there's a procedural element, right? And there's a uh, very big audience for that tone. I think um, really just wanting to incorporate a new setting into that canon, you know, um, and um, you know, like a show like Trickster, I don't know if you guys have seen Trickster, but it kind of has a lot of those elements, but it's a little more overt and it's a little less, this is more crime centric. Um, so you would kind of follow into, you would follow these dramas with the, the cops and the, the legal jurisdictions, uh, which is very timely right now, like the McGirt decision, you might be, a, you know, where all of the, the Cherokee Nation, for example, um, now has legal jurisdiction. And so there's like these tensions between the tribal police and the state authorities and the kid is caught in the middle and they're kind of, he's, um, they're kind of protecting the tribes, protecting him in a way, so. We have about 30 seconds left, Richard. Okay, very quickly, two questions that I always ask when I'm, when I'm hearing something is, is why now and why you? Uh, and I think you came straight out of the gate with the why you. Uh, and I love it when someone sets out their mission as a filmmaker because it says that this is a story that you have to tell and why would we go anywhere else? Even if we look at the script and we go, this is great, but let's find someone else. You, you've planted that flag. So really great job. The only other thing for me is some of the uh, comps that you made, I haven't seen. So uh, my bad on that front. But what that meant was that I'm still not fully, um, uh, I haven't fully landed on, is the show grounded in reality or is it grounded in its audience having to suspend a bit of disbelief because they don't understand perhaps the, the, the world that this is coming from, so they have to take a leap of faith. And, and that's, that's where I, I still don't have that full answer in my head. Okay. Um, right. I would, go ahead. We're actually out of time. I'm so okay. sorry, Good. Jeremy. <laughs> Tell me later, Jeremy. <laughs> yes, yeah. you'll be able to connect later and answer all of that. Yeah. Great job. All right, thank, thank you guys so much. I'm gonna invite Hannah. All right, Hannah. All right, and we're, this is, uh, Hannah's our last pitcher of today and she will be pitching Shelter. Hi, I'm Hannah and I'm here to talk to you about my one hour drama pilot, Shelter. Shelter is This Is Us meets Weeds and it tells the story of staff and residents of a domestic violence shelter in Oklahoma. I was born and raised in Oklahoma. I'm a Cherokee citizen and both sides of my family have called Oklahoma home for generations. I grew up on red clay, chasing lightning bugs and watching summer reruns on a 10 inch TV. And an overriding want of my childhood was to do something that mattered in the world. 
In my 20s, I worked as an advocate for human tra trafficking survivors at a domestic violence shelter. My job was to work with residents in shelter who had come out of trafficking situations, and I was there to help them acclimate to the shelter, um, process their experience, and plan their next steps. Shelter is a fictitious story, but in writing it, I did draw from my experience as an advocate navigating a new job. I wish you could know the women I knew when I worked at the shelter. I wish you could witness their incredible resilience firsthand, but this series is not my love letter to them. It's my apology. When I first started working as an advocate, my ideas of helping people were filtered through a perfectly branded, highly spiritualized flowchart understanding of justice. My experience changed that and I'm thankful and echoes of what I learned reverberate through the pilot of Shelter. The pilot episode follows our main character, Lauren, on her first day as a human trafficking advocate at the shelter. And by the end of the pilot, we learn that she has ulterior motives for taking the job. Here's what you need to know about Lauren. She's a people pleaser and she's grappling with some childhood trauma. After growing up in and out of homeless shelters, Lauren's mom, who had had a string of abusive relationships, left Lauren and her little sister, Kendra. Here's that ulterior motive. Lauren lied on her resume to get this job because she really wants to find her mom. And on top of all of that, her little sister Kendra's wedding is tonight and she needs to make it in time for pictures. When Lauren enters the shelter for the first time, she realizes that it's not that much different than the other shelters she's been in. The advocate's office is a colorful, cluttered room with a wild card energy. Even in the quiet moments, there's a sense that the next call to the hotline could change everything. She takes immediate notice of fellow advocate Seth, who's just annoyingly handsome. And even though he helps her with her job on the first day, it is an epically bad first day. They lose a kid, find drugs in the shelter. Everyone makes bets that Lauren won't last the month at her job and her car is towed. At the end of her shift, when she's changing into her very pink, pretty ugly bridesmaid's dress, a memory of her mom causes Lauren to have a panic attack that she cannot come back from. She scrambles out the door to leave just when a new resident arrives. And even though Kendra's wedding is minutes away, Lauren, such a people pleaser, agrees to stay behind to conduct the new resident's intake interview. Time slows as Lauren, still in her bridesmaid's dress, sits across from the new resident who holds an ice pack to her injuries after a run-in with her partner. We feel the gravity of the issues that those at the shelter must face, and we catch glimpses of what will make Lauren good at her job. But ultimately, she totally bombs the intake interview. Season one follows Lauren's first few months at the shelter. She is able to fix things with her sister Kendra, who is livid that Lauren misses her wedding. She grows closer to residents and staff at the shelter, fights a crush on the annoyingly handsome Seth, and gets better at her job. But just when everything seems like it's going to be okay, shelter staff finds out that she lied on her resume and Lauren finds out that her mom is on the way to the shelter. Everything's about to change. Though she's not me, Lauren will make some of my mistakes. She'll enter the shelter with an idea of what her job will be, only to find out that it is much more complicated. That at times it's more heartbreaking than you can take, and at others, it's strikingly beautiful and mercifully funny. Throughout the series, she'll come to learn what I did, that trauma does not tell a linear narrative, that the systems we have in place to help are held there by hard-won relationships, and to never underestimate the power of just sitting with someone when they're scared. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. I'd like to welcome the panel back. All right. Who's gonna go first this time? I'll go first this time. I thought that was great. I felt really, I really hung on every word that you said. I felt you were very in the moment and present with your delivery. I love how you implicated your story into your pitch in a way that was um, humble and that still sort of learning. And I, I felt like that was sort of ripe for interesting situations. So, yeah. I'll go. Um, 
Excellent. Well done. I, I too was hanging on every word. Uh, instantly felt the, the personal connection that you, you have to this story. Uh, could feel uh, the, the, the passion in your voice. I mean, it was incredibly palpable. Um, I mean, to the point where you just want to reach out and be like, ah, I wanted, I, I, don't, I don't know what to say. I'm just feel, filling with emotion. It's, it, it was fantastic. Um, and, I, and just in terms of straight pitch, I love the fact that you just give me a little bit and then, expo and then kind of tell me all the world, all the ways that we can go. As instead of giving me a, well, then we do this and then we do this and then we do this and then we do this. And then like, I'm in my mind, I'm trying to remember where all these characters are and who's who and how they look and whatever. Like you gave me such a condensed, boiled down, heartfelt, very strong entry into this world. And then just like, let it go and be like, here we go. This is all the different worlds that we can go. So um, I love it. Uh, who do I make these checks out to? <laughs> Is that a question I can answer? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, Hannah, I think you did a, f a fantastic job. I mean, um, pitch perfect, if you will, in my book. I love that you were able to draw me in. I really was able to stop thinking producer mode and think story mode. Um, I love how at the end, you, you know, because initially my thought was, oh, we're going to be in a shelter home is this going to be just like a, a serious drama that we're going to be you know battling with but then you you know I think you said I can't remember the beautiful words you use but the humor came in and it's sometimes mercifully humorous I think you said um, and I thought that was really really Im important mm -hmm. to remind us that there is levity in in such a dark place um, why why now and why Oklahoma I think that why Oklahoma, I think it's important for people to realize that this happens everywhere. And um, sometimes one of the things that I learned in this process was that like, you just never know what's happening across your street in your neighborhood. Um, why now? I think everyone has been through such a year, through such a season and when the world is going through something that's hard. There can be, I know that this is kind of, I don't know where this phrase comes from, from, but a tyranny of the urgent where you just hone in on you because you, you, and sometimes rightfully so, need to take care of yourself and your family. I think it's really important to realize that those that we push to the margins of our society feel the weight of these things in really hard, real ways. Um, and that that is something that the outside world reaches into the shelter in that way. Thank you. I'll go. Hannah, that was really, really beautiful and poetic and I felt clever. And um, I, I, I really, really did feel you and your pitch. So really, really great job. I would just be curious in terms of what what you how you see this as um, as an artist as a um, creator like I felt the story but now I was curious to um, see more kind of visually your statement your your even more uh, artistic visual takeaway for the audience mm -hmm. like you know, I, I got the comps, this is us and weeds and, and that's awesome. And I think I just want to know more even uh, <laughs> what your unique stamp on it um, will be okay. uh, visually. But that's beautiful, beautiful job. Thank you. I, uh, I thought you did a phenomenal job as well. Really, really beautiful job. I, clearly, this is something that completely touches your heart in a massive way, and that comes across. And you know, as I said a moment ago, it's always uh, why you, why now and why you? And I think the why you comes across in spades. And we just, I think to Patrick's point, there's that moment where we just want to put our arms out and sort of give you a hug or something just to say, hey, this is, you, you, this is, 
you, you took us with you on that journey. Um, I love the imagery that you played with. Uh, you know, you gave us hints of, of those sort of scenes where uh, there were times when I'm going, wow, this is getting really deep. And then suddenly she's in a wedding dress, sitting in a, in a bridesmaid's dress, sitting there uh, on the intake. And I, I can see those juxtapositions, which, which I, I was really fun to see and, and to hear it, because that helped me constantly just remind myself that actually this isn't just a drama. Um, uh, if, I, if you could wave a magic wand, I suppose I've got two questions. One of them might be a bit unfair. Um, uh, where would you see this? What, what network? What, what, who would be the distributor? And then have you given any thought to if you could really wave your magic wand, who that leading actress would be? I love these questions. Um, I think that with the subject material, I wouldn't want to shy away from the reality of it. Um, so finding a home on something like Showtime or HBO where there would be a place to not sugarcoat or, you know, to give justice to the issues we're dealing with. I think that's really important. Um, as far as who I would like to be the main actress or actor, I would like to continue to think about that. I have a few ideas, but I don't, I don't have anything solidified right now in my mind. And I'm so, uh, that's another question that with the visual question or the question of like what visual elements to use, it's like, wow, I get to continue to create, you know, and continue to think about these things, which is really fun and exciting. And, and all of that can just really improve the story and script, so. All right, you guys, that is time. Thank you so much. Thank you to the panel. Thank you to Hannah. Um, and I'm going to ask everybody to turn their cameras off for just a second for me. I just want to let you guys know I'm so incredibly proud of all of the uh, creators on uh, our Series Fest Roadshow. And I'm going to bring Lauren back in from Series Fest. There she is. Hey, um, I think I've got some important takeaways from the Bitchathon today. Uh, number one, we need like virtual Kleenex. So when we have the emotional <laughs> moments that we can all kind of just um and Oklahoma I was ready to move there um after Drew's pitch because when climate change hits I'm ready to go but then now I'm concerned about the tigers <laughs> when the weather gets real so I'm yeah. very you know I'm still gonna do it um but I'm just putting it out there that we should be concerned about the weather and tigers running amok but um I just want to say thank you to everybody you guys did such a great job and I'm so thankful for our panelists for joining us. The winning creator will receive a virtual badge to Series Fest Season 7, which takes place June 24th through July 11th virtually. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about Series Fest or the year-round programs, please go to seriesfest.com. And to find out more about filming in Oklahoma, check out okfilmmusic.org. Um, thank you guys. I, such a great time. I learned so much and um, I feel inspired. So uh, Can we please, bring everybody back to say goodbye. Come back. Thank you. Thank you. Group waves. Oh, guys. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here. And thank you to Oklahoma um, and uh, film and music. Thank you. Thank you. Um, be well. And um, we will let you know who gets to come to Series Fest virtually this year. <laughs>